On this episode of On Subrogation, we're going to talk about government liability, specifically sovereign immunity as it relates to state and local governments. If you're looking for questions of how to file a federal tort claim and issues regarding federal tort liability, see our other episode that specifically covers that. I'm Jason Sullivan, and let's start with what is sovereign immunity? So sovereign immunity is the theory that the government can do no wrong. States are not held liable for their torts. If someone is injured because of state action, they're not liable. Most states in the United States have abolished this. They've changed it either through their state constitution or through state statute. However, those waivers of immunity are usually limited or have exceptions. One of the main exceptions we see is a dollar amount threshold. A lot of states will waive immunity for a state agency or the state government or a city or a county, but only to a specific dollar amount. Now, if you're handling auto subrogation cases, most of these limits are in the six figures. So you don't have to worry about a claim being barred or limited by a state statute in that way. However, if you have home or commercial policies, just think of a sewer backup and the amount of damage that can cause. If the government can be held liable, it's not uncommon for that a level of damage to exceed what might be the cap on the state liability. So that's the first limit on a waiver of sovereign immunity is damages. There's also specific acts that are limited in some cases. So in Alaska, for instance, there's sovereign immunity for firefighters. And if you think about this, this makes a lot of sense. Firefighters come to the scene. They're trying to rescue people and property. To find them negligent and hold them responsible for things while they're carrying out their duties, some might say that's unfair. And so in Alaska, they have carved out the exception to the waiver and firefighters can't be found liable. Similarly, in Mississippi, police and firefighters won't be found liable unless they have reckless disregard for persons who are not committing a criminal act. Again, same theory. If you're rushing to the scene of an emergency, you're not going to hold those individuals liable just on a regular standard of negligence. There are other states also, Ohio, Oklahoma, New Jersey. Those states say that we will waive sovereign immunity, but not for subrogation claims. What this means is me as a private citizen, let's just say I'm parked on the street and a police car runs into my car. I, as an individual, have a claim against that police department for the damages to my vehicle. But let's say I submit the claim to my insurance company. My insurance company pays for my damages and then they want to subrogate against that police department. In Ohio, Oklahoma, New Jersey, and in Connecticut where it's slightly disputed, you can't pursue that as an insurance carrier. Essentially, there is no subrogation against the state. How do you know if there's a government entity involved? This may not be as straightforward as it might seem. If you have a police report that shows there's a snowplow owned by the Department of Transportation or that it was a police car owned by the county sheriff, that's a little bit easier. But when you have cases such as a pothole case in a road and it's disputed, is the city responsible for that road? Which city? Maybe it's on the border. Or is the county responsible? Frequently there are arrangements and deals where certain entities are responsible for road maintenance and repair that are not necessarily obvious to you, the person who's driving on the road. Another thing to look out for too is transportation association. Very frequently, these are state or local agencies. Sometimes though, they're private agencies. And it's not always clear on the face of it whether or not it's a, a state entity or a private entity. If it's a state entity, then you need to look for a sovereign or a waiver of sovereign immunity. If it's not, then you would have your regular negligence case. So knowing that there are special rules that are in place, the question is, why does it matter so much? And a lot of it is because of deadlines. And I like to think of it as there being two deadlines. First, most states have a notice deadline. And what that means is there are requirements by statute that you have to put the state or city on notice of the claim before you file suit. It's called a jurisdictional prerequisite. And basically, the court can't even hear the case unless that notice requirement's been met. The reason that is so tricky is a lot of these notice requirements are shorter than the statute of limitations. In some cases, they're as short as six months from the date of the loss. The other thing about it is what you must include and to whom you must send that notice. Because all of this is statutory with the waiver of sovereign immunity, most states have statutes that state, here's what you must put in the notice, here's when you must send it, and here's who you have to send it to. Indiana, for instance, if it's a claim against the state, you have to send it to the attorney general or that state agency, 
notice there's an or, you have your choice. And that notice must be sent within 270 days of the loss. Statute also puts forward what you must include, where the loss happened, facts of the loss, the amount of damages, why you think the state is liable. Those are all things that you must be put in. And it makes a little sense, right? Most of your standard subrogation letters are gonna have that information. Importantly though, you have to send it certified or registered mail. Most letters don't go out that way. So unless you realize that I must send it this way and request that it specifically be done so, you may be sending demand letters and you may not get a response or your claim may later be barred because it didn't meet that statutory requirement. If we stick with Indiana for a minute and we talk about the local agencies, in those cases you only have 180 days to file your claim. And again, you must send your notice to the local executive board or the executive that is running that local agency, city, county, whatever it may be. And you must also send it to the claims risk um, board that's been set up in the state. So you have two parties that you must send it to, short in time frame. Now Indiana, one of the states that I practice in, they have a substantial compliance rule. If you send out these notice requirements, if you send out the notice and the requirement substantially complies with what's in the statute, that's gonna be acceptable. There are other states where that is not and they require strict conformity to whatever the statute requires. And just one example of that, in Utah there was a case Wheeler versus McPherson. And in that case, three people were injured while they were riding in a car. They were struck by a county vehicle driven by a county employee while he was working on the job. So three people have injuries so they wanna make a claim on the county where that was permitted. They make the claim, they send three letters, one each to each of the three commissioners, and they send a letter to the county's insurance company. They get a response back. They say, hey, the claim is being assigned to an adjuster. There's back and forth negotiation. Unfortunately, they can't get it settled, and so they file a lawsuit. In that lawsuit, the county files a motion to dismiss because they failed to meet the notice requirements. Utah Supreme Court in that case agreed with the county and said the requirements weren't met. They sent letters to each of the commissioners and to the insurance company. The statute required that those letters go to the county clerk. No letter was sent to the county clerk, and even though the county clearly had notice of it, it was clearly on record with their insurance company, there were notices back and forth, the Supreme Court said, sorry, that wasn't strict compliance, the statute says what it says, if you don't meet it, you haven't met the notice requirement. If you fail to meet the notice requirement, you can't file suit. The tough thing about that is those people sent those letters in seven months before the notice was going to expire. But they had dialogue with the county and in their minds they thought they had a valid claim. So that is one thing you have to think of. Just because you get a response from a government entity doesn't mean that you've met the notice requirements. So the notice is an especially tricky and a probably one of the most important things you want to take away from this session today. The other thing is statute of limitations. And this is the second requirement and it's distinct from the notice. The notice is the time frame you have to put the government on notice. If you put them on notice, then you may have time to file a lawsuit. And in a lot of states, this statute of limitations against a government entity is going to be shorter than your standard negligence statute of limitations. So with that, you might have two years if you were suing a private individual, but in that state, you may only have one year from the date of loss. An even trickier scenario is when that statute of limitations is not set off the date of loss, but rather off the date of a rejection. So if you send in your notice and you receive a response back from let's say the city and they say we reject your claim, in some states you only have a time period such as six months from them sending that notice of rejection to file the lawsuit. So it is especially important as you're working these files where there might be a government entity involved to pay close attention to their correspondence and look for that rejection so that you can make sure that if you do need to escalate it and file it during the statute of limitations, that you meet that statute of limitations. So to recap, when you're going against a government entity or investigating a claim where a government entity, a state, a city, a county might be involved, one, make sure it's a government entity involved. Do that investigation. If there's an acronym that you don't recognize, Look it up, find out how have they been sued before? Is this a private entity or is this a public agency and part of a state or a county or a city? That will get you in a position so you can begin to work the claim in the right way. Once you do that, you can then begin to look into, is there an exception to the waiver of sovereign immunity? Maybe it's a police officer and maybe the facts don't support reckless disregard as is required in Mississippi. 
Finally, you can look for the notice period and make sure you get it to the right people at the right time in the right format with the right delivery system. All of those things really need to be in place so that if you can't resolve the claim, then if you need to file suit, you can do so. And that's finally it, making sure you're cognizant of the statute of limitations, which may be different than the statute of limitation that you're normally used to. Thank you for joining us on this session. Again, I'm Jason Sullivan, and for on subrogation, that's the long and tortured.